BBC News at six o'clock. This is Neil Sleet. Good evening. Meghan Markle has won her privacy claim against the Mail on Sunday, with the High Court ruling its publication of a letter to her father was manifestly excessive and hence unlawful. The Health Secretary has unveiled proposals for reorganising the NHS in England and to get it to work more cohesively with social care services. Trials have shown that a drug usually prescribed for arthritis can help keep seriously ill Covid patients out of intensive care and could significantly reduce deaths. A coroner is referring the body which oversees England's main roads to the Crown Prosecution Service after a grandmother died on a smart motorway which had the hard shoulder open to traffic. Ireland's Prime Minister has called on what he describes as the big beasts of Europe to cool it in their post-Brexit dealings with the UK, saying his country could be damaged by ongoing disputes. Also tonight, the Everest summit fakery Fandango that has led Nepal to ban two climbers from its peaks. The Duchess of Sussex has won her High Court privacy claim against the Mail on Sunday. Meghan Markle took legal action after the newspaper published a letter she had written to her estranged father in August 2018. Her lawyers argued that printing the letter was a triple-barrelled assault on her private life, her family life and her correspondence. The judge agreed that she had a reasonable expectation that the contents of the letter would remain private. Associated newspapers said they were surprised and disappointed at the judgment. Our royal correspondent Johnny Diamond has this report. What threatened to turn into a legal carnival, with her father testifying against Meghan and her friends being called to court from across the Atlantic, has instead become a pretty thumping victory for the Duchess. In 2019, she sued the group that owns the Mail on Sunday for publishing a deeply personal letter she'd written to her father the year before. She claimed breach of privacy, copyright and data regulation. Hearings came and went and costs piled up, well north of £3 million. In January, her legal team applied for summary judgment from the court, arguing that the Mail on Sunday had no viable defence. And today the court largely agreed. The publication of the letter said the judge was manifestly excessive and hence unlawful. The Duchess's reasonable expectation of privacy had been interfered with. On copyright, the judge dismissed the newspaper's public interest defence, but said that a more narrow point as to who owned the copyright could still go to trial. In a written statement voiced up by the BBC, the Duchess expressed her gratitude, but also her dismay at what she called the illegal and dehumanising practices of the Mail on Sunday. These tactics and those of their sister publications, Mail Online and The Daily Mail, are not new. In fact, they've been going on for far too long without consequence. For these outlets, it's a game. For me and so many others, it's real life, real relationships and very real sadness. The damage they have done and continue to do runs deep. Associated newspapers expressed surprise and disappointment at the court's judgment. They may yet appeal. The lawyer Mark Stevens, who specialises in media-related cases, said that there would be an impact on reporting. If you can't effectively report on leaked letters, then in those circumstances the media holding people to account is going to be ham hampered. Essentially, this judgment, in its widest context, puts manacles on the media. Royals rarely sue. The attendant publicity often outweighs any victory in court. But the Duchess's deep hurt over the publication of her heartfelt letter to her father has been plain to see in court filings. This may not be quite over, but the Duchess has won a significant victory. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has insisted government plans to reorganise the NHS in England are essential to improve how it operates. The proposals amount to a reversal of major changes introduced under David Cameron in 2012. Mr Hancock told MPs they would allow health and care services to work more closely together and remove bureaucracy. But his Labour shadow, Jonathan Ashworth, questioned why structural change was even being considered in the middle of the biggest crisis the NHS had ever faced. More details from our health correspondent, Laura Foster. Matt Hancock told the Commons the health service had to be accountable to ministers and parliament. He said a more integrative, more innovative and more responsive system was required. The government wants health and social care to work more closely together. 
That's because currently one in three people admitted to hospital in an emergency have at least five complex health conditions, such as asthma, diabetes or obesity. Ten years ago, NHS England says that figure was only one in ten. Mr Hancock said the changes were not only about providing treatments, but helping people stay healthy in the first place. This white paper enables greater integration, reduces bureaucracy and supports the way that the NHS and social care work when they work at their best together. Out would go requirements to tender contracts. Instead, councils and NHS services would be told to pool resources and decision making. But Labour is questioning why these changes are being proposed now in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Shadow Health Secretary John Ashworth said his party had long argued for a more joined-up approach. We need a long-term funded workforce plan. We've not got one. We need a long-term cross-governmental health inequalities plan. We've not got one. And we need a sustainable social care plan. We were promised one on the steps of Downing Street. We still don't uh, uh, have one. These are just proposals at the moment and will now be subject to a period of consultation. It is too soon to know whether they'll lead to what the UK population wants the most. Shorter waiting times, higher survival rates and better patient care. The latest figures from NHS England say that in December, more than 220,000 people had been waiting longer than a year for routine hospital treatment. That's the highest monthly figure since April 2008. Separate figures revealed a recent surge in COVID patients, almost a third of all the people who have needed hospital treatment for the virus since the pandemic began, were admitted in January. Here's our health correspondent, Catherine Burns. In December 2019, almost 1,500 people in England had been waiting more than 12 months for an operation. In December 2020, that number was 150 times bigger, almost 225,000 people. These procedures are officially referred to as routine surgery, such as knee and hip operations. But for people waiting, it can mean living in constant pain. I haven't left the house for a year. I've been unable to move. Brenda Pugh used to be able to walk the dog, see friends and go to work. But she needs a double hip replacement and the operation keeps being cancelled because of the pandemic. The impact has been huge. It's been very, very far reaching on all levels, financial emotional, psychological, it's, yeah, it's, it's been really, really difficult. In total, there are now four and a half million people on waiting lists in England, the highest number since records began in 2007. People with cancer have been less affected. The number starting treatment is in line with pre-pandemic levels. These figures are all for December. The impact of the surge in cases in the new year is not yet known. But in January, hospitals in England treated more than 100,000 COVID patients. That's almost a third of all confirmed cases in hospital since the pandemic started. The government is coming under mounting pressure from MPs and businesses to clarify whether people will be able to go on summer holidays this year. Ministers have been accused of giving mixed messages about the chances of travel while efforts continue to contain COVID-19. But that doesn't seem to have deterred people from making bookings in the UK. Our business correspondent Theo Leggett reports. Holidaymakers and businesses are eager to know whether or not people will be able to travel at home or abroad this summer. But the government has been accused of lacking clarity on the issue. The Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, said people shouldn't be making bookings. But Matt Hancock was less clear. We want to make sure that everybody can have a holiday this summer. And we will know more and we're more likely to all be able to, and it's all more likely to go well, if the vaccine rollout continues uh, to go well. Mr Hancock admitted he booked his own summer break in Cornwall months ago, and he's not the only one. Travel operators across the country say demand is still very high. Andrew Baragwanath owns and runs Air Holiday Park in St Ives. Our advance bookings are very strong for the summer. I would say stronger than we've ever known, both on our holiday caravans and also on our touring and camping site. Basically from June through till September, we've got very little availability now. But advanced bookings will count for little if people aren't allowed to travel this summer. And many businesses say if that's the case, they'll struggle to survive the following winter. A further 678 people have died in the UK within 28 days of a positive Covid test. 
Another 13,494 cases have been confirmed. More than 13.5 million people have now received the first dose of a vaccine. Six out of ten people who have died from coronavirus had a disability, according to new figures. The report from the Office for National Statistics showed that disabled people were up to 2.9 times more likely to die than those without a disability. Nikki Fox has the story. The findings show how disproportionately impacted disabled people have been throughout the pandemic. From January to November last year, 60% of those who died from the virus were disabled. According to the last census in 2011, they make up around 17% of the overall population. The data looked at people aged between 30 and 100 years old and found women with more severe disabilities were far more at risk. Like Kath Gentles, she lost her life in November. She was 49. A huge sci-fi fan and lover of life, Kath had spina bifida and used a wheelchair. When the pandemic hit, she stayed at home, but it's thought she may have caught the virus from one of her support workers. Her sister, Andrea Joel, doesn't want Kath's death to be just another statistic. Sometimes I think people think, oh, well, and it's the same with elderly people. Oh, well, they're old. They've had their life. Oh, well, they're disabled. They're not having much life anyway. But they do, you know, people do. Everybody has a life. For the first time, the ONS also took other health conditions into account. But even when they were included, along with class, where someone lived and age, disabled people were still more at risk. The government says it recognises the virus has had a disproportionate impact on the millions of people living with a disability and is taking steps to protect them. Doctors say they've made a huge step forward in coronavirus treatments, with a drug normally given to people with arthritis. A major trial has shown that tocilizumab, when combined with a steroid, can help keep the most seriously ill patients out of intensive care. The researchers believe it could reduce COVID deaths in hospital by between a third and a half. More details from our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. The recovery trial is the world's biggest COVID treatment study. 36,000 patients across the UK have been enrolled to test a variety of medicines. The first drug proven to work was the steroid dexamethasone. Now there's the rheumatoid arthritis drug tocilizumab. Professor Martin Landre from the recovery trial says the combination of the two cuts the risk of death dramatically. Compared with a year ago when we really did not know how to uh, treat this disease, we now have two treatments. They both act on the immune system, dexamethasone and tocilizumab, put them together and we reduce the risk of death by a third or even as much as a half in the sickest patients. That's great news. Dexamethasone costs just £5 per course of treatment. Tocilizumab, a one-off infusion, at least £500. But trials have shown it helps prevent patients needing intensive care, which costs around £2,000 a day. Covid remains a brutal disease, but the chances of surviving it are improving. A woman who killed her disabled son last August has been told she will be detained in hospital indefinitely. The Old Bailey heard that Olga Freeman suffocated 10-year-old Dylan at their home in West London after having a breakdown. Before the pandemic, he'd been attending a special school for five days a week but had to stay at home because of Covid restrictions. The judge described the boy as an indirect victim of the pandemic. Highways England could face corporate manslaughter charges in connection with the death of a grandmother on a smart motorway in South Yorkshire in 2018. A coroner has asked the Crown Prosecution Service to examine the case of Nargis Begum, who was 62 and from Sheffield. In January, another coroner said smart motorways should be reviewed after an inquest heard the deaths of two men on the M1 could have been avoided. Our transport correspondent Caroline Davis has more details. Nargis Begum and her husband broke down on the M1 just outside Sheffield in September 2018. She left their car and was waiting for help when another vehicle crashed into it, which then hit her. Smart motorways don't always operate the hard shoulder, and in this case they were waiting in a live lane. A pre-inquest review heard that warning notices alerting other drivers to the danger ahead were not switched on until 22 minutes after the car had broken down. By then the collision had happened. 
the coroner, Nicola Mundy, has referred the motorway's operator, Highways England, for possible charges, saying nobody has responsibility for monitoring the motorway cameras. In a statement, Mrs Begum's daughter, Syma, said the family were pleased with the decision and that they were determined to campaign for changes to smart motorways. Highways England says it does not believe it committed any offence and it will cooperate with any investigation. You're listening to the Six O'Clock News on BBC Radio 4, the main news so far. The High Court has ruled that the Mail on Sunday's publication of a letter from Meghan Markle to her father was manifestly excessive and hence unlawful. The Health Secretary has unveiled proposals for reorganising the NHS in England and to get it to work more cohesively with social care services. The Irish Prime Minister, Micheál Martin, has urged European Union countries and the UK to move away from the idea that they're in an ongoing... ...tensions have increased in recent weeks over coronavirus vaccine supply and the part of the withdrawal agreement designed to prevent a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. In a BBC interview, Mr Martin said he was worried that his country could become collateral damage. He was speaking to our correspondent, Fergal Keane. After weeks of discord between London and Brussels and within Northern Ireland, the mood in Dublin is wary. There's apprehension that disputes arising out of Brexit will unsettle the peace process. The Taoiseach is also conscious of the vital economic relationship. Ireland is among the top ten of the UK's import and export markets. Hence his appeal to British and EU leaders. Dial it down. This isn't an ongoing sort of battle between UK and some of the bigger beasts of Europe. Like, let's move away from that kind of... Uh, we'll so be, the French, we'll be, per- French particularly. Yeah, they need to cool it. We, we, we'll be collateral damage and all of that. Uh, hence the protocol, in my view. Um, so everyone needs to cool it a bit. Mr Martin said any extension to the grace period for the Northern Ireland Protocol would have to take place within the time frame of a year, not the two years sought by the British government. The row over the protocol comes amid heightened unionist fears that the trade border in the Irish Sea could eventually become a political one, with pressure growing from Sinn Féin for a referendum on a united Ireland. This after opinion polls suggesting growing support for such a vote. The Taoiseach told me a border poll within the next five years would be a mistake and that crude majoritarianism shouldn't decide the future of the island. This reflects, in part, his fear that pushing too fast could provoke loyalist paramilitary violence. The head of the European Union's securities and markets watchdog, Stephen Majur, has claimed that London may have permanently lost its position as the main European hub for share trading. The city was overtaken by Amsterdam last month due to a change of rules caused by Brexit. The Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, has warned Brussels may be looking to cut the UK off from its financial markets. Our global trade correspondent, Darshini David, reports. Last year's Brexit deal focused mainly on trading goods with the EU, with little mention of financial services, despite those markets accounting for 40% of the city's exports. The implications are becoming clear. Over £8 billion worth of shares were traded daily in Amsterdam last month as permissions to trade those of EU companies in London largely ceased. The British government wants an arrangement to resume financial services access to the single market on the basis that its standards are equivalent to the EU's. But Brussels' demands differ and the head of its securities watchdog suggested share trading may not be part of any deal. The UK government hopes the city will retain dominance in other areas and will strengthen links outside the EU. It's a work in progress. The boss of one exchange described a deal that allows Swiss shares to be traded in London as being like a free kick in a football match rather than an equaliser. It doesn't compensate for what's been lost. Europe's biggest oil company, Royal Dutch Shell, has announced plans to cut its net carbon emissions to zero by 2050 and gradually reduce its oil production, which peaked in 2019. Shell wants to expand its renewables, biofuels and hydrogen businesses while increasing its network of electric vehicle charging points. But it said it would continue to sell fossil fuels well into the 2030s. Our business editor, Simon Jack, has the details. Under pressure from climate groups and investors to explain how it intends to be a net zero company by 2050, Shell today outlined its 30-year plan. It announced interim targets of cutting emissions by between 6 and 8% by 2023, 45% by 2035 and 100% by 2050. 
However, it still plans to invest $8 billion a year in oil production, more than double its $3 billion annual investment in renewables in the coming years, and said that while oil production would fall between 1% and 2% per year over the next decade, gas production might rise slightly. Its plan relies on taking carbon out of the atmosphere by capturing and storing it and offsetting emissions by planting trees. What is eye-catching is Shell's commitment to reduce emissions created by the products it sells to its customers. Come 2050, Shell won't sell to customers who don't deal with their own emissions. Having cut payouts last year, Shell promised to increase its dividend 4% every year from now on. That's the balance. Doing enough to keep shareholders feeling green, but not at the expense of making those shareholders feel poor. The current chief executive, along with the current crop of politicians, will be long gone by 2050. In a rapidly changing world, 30-year targets should perhaps be considered more a vision than a plan. In the city, the 100 share index ended the day up four points at 6,529. On Wall Street a short time ago, the Dow Jones was down 124 points at 31,314. On the currency markets, the pound is down three-tenths of a cent against the dollar at $1.38.1 cents. Sterling is also down three-tenths of a cent against the euro at €1.13.9, making a euro worth 87.8 pence. The parliamentary bill authorising the second phase of the HS2 high-speed rail link between the West Midlands and Crewe has become law. Boris Johnson described it as a landmark moment. Supporters of the project say it will spur economic growth, help level up the country and provide greener transport. But it continues to face strong opposition from environmental groups. Our environment analyst Roger Harabin reports. Phase 2A of the project will be the first major railway built in the north of England for more than 100 years. It'll run for 36 miles and help cut 34 minutes off the journey from Crewe to London when it opens between 2029 and 2033. HS2 says at least 5,000 jobs will be supported by the new phase, with many more in the supply chain. But HS2 was commissioned to cope with the ever-increasing passenger numbers before the pandemic forced people to embrace online video meetings. Ministers believe demand will bounce back, but admit they can't be sure, and critics call this a gamble with £100 billion of public money. The government says pausing the project would threaten thousands of jobs and undermine the construction industry. But there's another issue too. HS2 is described by the industry as a green project, But environmentalists say that however cleanly the trains eventually run, vast amounts of CO2 will be created by the steel and cement involved in the construction of the track. Professor Tony May from Leeds University's Transport Unit says that will take decades to neutralise. It takes 65 years from completion before HS2 is carbon neutral. So up to 2050, which is our critical deadline, HS2 is a carbon burden. It doesn't save carbon at all. At London's Euston station, anti-HS2 campaigners are still living in tunnels underground. They're dug in for a long fight. A senior Microsoft executive has backed the Australian government in a row about whether online giants should have to pay for news that appears in searches or is shared on their platforms. Facebook and Google have threatened to pull some or all of their services out of the country completely because of the plan. But the president of Microsoft has said it strengthens democracy by supporting a free press. Here's our media editor, Amol Rajan. The intervention of Brad Smith, Microsoft's president, in a debate about the future of the internet is surprising and significant. For years, news publishers have argued that their business models have been wrecked because online advertising flows mostly to just two companies. Google and Facebook account for around 60% of all global digital advertising revenue. Publishers further argue that their journalism makes such platforms more attractive and that they are therefore entitled to a share of the spoils. Australia's government agrees. In response, the technology giants say they already send huge volumes of traffic back to the publishers and that it is a fundamental principle of the web that anybody can link to anybody else for free. Moreover, in recent years, Google and Facebook have bowed to pressure from various governments and are beginning to pay publishers directly, though on the platform's terms. Now Brad Smith, number two at the second most valuable company in the world, is arguing that the economic imbalance between technology and journalism needs urgent redress 
and that the US government should copy Australia's proposal. A tipping point may just have been reached. The Football Association and the Premier League have united with the rest of England's football bodies and written to the heads of Facebook and Twitter demanding they accept responsibility for eradicating racism. An executive from Facebook told the BBC this week that he was horrified at the online abuse of players which continued last night when the Swansea midfielder Jan Dander was targeted after his side's FA Cup defeat. Here's our senior sports news reporter, Laura Scott. In footballing terms, this might amount to a caution before ascending off. The chief executive of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, and Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, have been told their platforms are havens for illegal abuse and that their inaction has led anonymous perpetrators to believe they're beyond reach. Seven leading figures in English football have appealed to their basic human decency in a letter calling for four key changes – these cover filtering and blocking racist and discriminatory material before it's posted, tougher measures to remove abusive material, improved verification processes and giving assistance to investigating authorities. The Football Association's Director of Diversity, Edleen John, wants emojis that are used regularly in abusive messages to be discontinued and said there's no time to waste in taking action. We cannot be having this conversation in another two or three years time where we say, gosh, nothing has changed from a social media perspective. Legislation hasn't yet come into play, et cetera, et cetera. In my mind, this change needs to happen quickly because it's having the damaging and lasting effects on individuals. And that is just not good enough. Tougher legislation is on the horizon, police investigations are ongoing and Facebook has said it will change the rules governing direct messaging on Instagram. But football's leadership wants social media's leadership to go further to bring relentless abuse to an end. Average house prices in Wales have topped £200,000 for the first time after what some analysts have described as a race for space during the pandemic. Figures from the country's biggest building society, the Principality, suggest annual rises of up to 16% in some areas. Here's our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith. Last year's first lockdown brought a sudden suspension of the housing market. In the second half of the year, when sales resumed and transaction taxes were cut, pent-up demand drove double-digit percentage price increases in areas such as Anglesey, Conway and Flincher in North Wales. Larger, detached houses have seen the greatest increases. The Principality says the pandemic has led to some customers looking for bigger homes with more space in less densely populated areas. For first-time buyers in rural Wales, it has exacerbated the problem of being priced out to their communities. The Welsh Government has already announced a tax increase on the purchase of second homes, but with prices in Wales still considerably lower than the UK average, it may not be enough to slow the rise. Two Indian climbers have been banned from mountaineering in Nepal for lying about conquering Mount Everest. An investigation was launched after rumours started circulating about their ascent being faked. Victoria Bourne reports. Reaching the top of Everest is a crowning achievement for mountaineers around the world. In spring 2016, Narendra Singh Yadav and Seema Rani Goswami claimed they had reached the summit of the world's highest mountain. Their climb was certified by Nepal's tourism department, but suspicions surfaced among Indian mountaineers when Narendra Singh Yadav was listed for India's Tenzing Norgate Adventure Award last year. This prompted Nepal to launch an investigation, which found that the pair had submitted false documents and could not produce any reliable evidence of their ascent to the peak. Mr Yadav, Ms Goswami and their team leader have been banned for six years starting retrospectively in 2016. Their Everest Summit certification has been revoked and the trekking company and Sherpas involved in the expedition have been fined. Parts of Scotland have experienced one of the coldest nights in more than a quarter of a century. The Met Office says temperatures in the remote village of Braemar in Aberdeenshire dropped to minus 22.9 Celsius overnight. That's the lowest February temperature since 1955. Malcolm McIntyre, who's part of Braemar's mountain rescue team, said the weather was bone-chilling. It's actually an absolutely beautiful day outside, but really cold and crisp and clear. Um, the snow is about a metre deep, just pr pretty much everywhere. Um, and although it looks absolutely beautiful, it is absolutely freezing when you step outside the door. You can just feel it in your breath, you can feel it in your face, even though it looks great. The headlines again. The Duchess of Sussex has won a High Court privacy claim against the Mail on Sunday over its publication of a letter to her father. 
The Health Secretary Matt Hancock has insisted government plans to reorganise the NHS in England are vital to improve care. New figures show the number of people waiting for more than a year for routine hospital treatment in England has reached its highest level since 2008. Pressure is growing on ministers to clarify whether people will be able to go on summer holidays this year. Trials in the UK have shown that a drug normally used to treat arthritis can save the lives of some seriously ill coronavirus patients. BBC News. And the news was read for the last time by Neil Sleet.